podcast that you're listening to is being presented to you in cooperation with the SJ Network. If you're a person who'd like to appear on a podcast, contact Stephen Joyner at s-j-network.com. Let's get on with the show. Today's episode of The Sherpa Screening Room will be very interesting. It features an interview with Titanic expert Bill Willard. It's amazing that so much time has passed since it sank. I know. As I get older, I remember all the people I lost along the way. Maybe my budding career as a tour guide was not the right choice. Attention, rebels of the Sherpolution. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. We would like to give you a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial, simply by heading to www.audibletrial.com Sherpa. There are over 180,000 titles of audiobooks and podcasts, including this one, to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. And now, the one and only Mr. Bruce will lead you into the Sherpa Chalet. As a reminder, everyone who checks into the Sherpa Chalet will find $1,000 in cash under their pillow. As sure as my name is Congressman George Santos. Coming to you from Sherpa Chalet in beautiful downtown Mount Podcastia, it's time for entertainment interviews in the Sherpa Screening Room. Grab an aisle seat and a bucket of popcorn, but don't crunch too loud or you'll miss the show. Now, here's your host, Jim, the podcast Sherpa. Hello there, Rebels of the Sherpa Lucian. Welcome to the Sherpa Screening Room. It is a presentation of Too Many Podcasts, and if that's the case, then I must be Jim the Podcast Sherpa. Of course, I say that same joke all the time, so then who else would be repeating the same joke? I don't know. It's me. I'm back after a uh, little bit of an absence. It's been some time since I've been working on the show, folks. Uh, a lot of the interviews that you've heard were actually part of my backlog, and I was very backlogged. <laughs> <laughs> and as you can kind of hear in my voice, I sound a little weird. Yeah, I know, that's kind of redundant. I had some vocal cord issues, and I'm um, still getting through them, but uh, I can make a recording, so that's a good thing. I would like to offer a thank you to Superfan Mike and Lord Mr. Bruce for covering for parts of my show while I could not do any recording. So, greatly appreciated. Good friends. That's a sign of a good friend that'll just reach out and help you right at the spur of a moment when you need it. Thank you so much. And also, special thanks to Sherpa Wife for taking such good care of me. She put a gag in my mouth so I wouldn't talk. That's, well, you know, it's it's some sort of help, I guess. So anyway, uh, where are we? Yes, we are here in the Sherpa Screening Room, and you are listening, and it's a good thing that you're listening, folks. Uh, these are the shows that we get to speak to folks who are in the entertainment field. You know, they are entertainers, actors, writers, directors, and my guest today is an author, but he's best known as a speaker and an expert on, you guessed it, the Titanic. His name is Bill Willard. He's coming to us from North Carolina. I had a really great time talking to him. It was a very educational conversation and a lot of fun, too. You'll hear Bill is a super nice guy. I think you're really going to enjoy what he has to say, and you will be fascinated as well. The man is definitely a captivating speaker, and before my voice goes out, I think we should go right ahead and listen to what he's got to say. Hello there, Rebels. We are here in the Sherpa Screening Room, and, you know, I have guests who have done deep dives, but I think my guest today definitely defines what a deep dive is. His name is Bill Willard. He's coming to us from North Carolina, and he is a Titanic expert. He has presented over 400 presentations on the Titanic. He actually accompanied a crew to recover some of the pieces from the Titanic. We're going to talk about that, and we're going to get to know him a little bit better. Bill, welcome to the show. Thank you, Jim. It's an honor to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, I'm, I'm glad that you can come. Now, your interest was originally piqued by A Night to Remember, the, but the book. The book. Originally, I was a, a, a middle school student having to do book reports. Old people will remember having to do book reports from the library. <laughs> These new kids don't know what those are. And I picked a night to remember. And one of the great memories about that is I start reading and I visualize, I put myself into the book and I couldn't put it down. I read it three times in two weeks. And one night my mom calls in and she said, she calls in from the other bedroom. She said, Bill, 
uh, are you okay? And I said, yeah, I'm, I'm reading. I'm almost finished with this chapter. And she said, you know, it's almost four o'clock in the morning and you've got to get up in three hours to go to school. <laughs> and it was a school night and I was just so into that book, I could not put it down. And so um, that started my interest. I was able to watch the movie A Night to Remember. Um, there was uh, the Clifton Webb uh, version, Titanic. Robert Wagner is in it. Barbara Stanwyck is in it. Great old movie where the son jumps on uh, up to be with the father near the end. And um, so that was a great classic. And then came the 1979 version, um, SOS Titanic. David Warner was in it. And I'm the super geek in the movie theater watching those all by myself. You know, there were a few people there the first time, but after four or five days, here I am sitting by myself with my popcorn. Uh, Clive Cussler's book was turned into a movie. Um, Raise the Titanic. Raise the Titanic, which we know now to be total fiction because we wish the ship was in one piece and could be raised. But I had to go back and see that several times. The scene of the ship coming out of the water just captured our breath. And Alec Guinness had the best scene in the movie when he was telling his story about being on the great ship herself. <laughs> what do you think is the the enduring fascination with the Titanic? Just because it was just so unique that it was the largest ship of its time and, and it sunk on its maiden voyage. And there's, there's kind of like a mystery behind it as well. Is, is that what it holds for you or is it a little bit more than that? There's a magnetism. It draws people all over the world. It really does. In the United States, for example, a lot of the third and fourth grade classes talk about the ship in their some of their um, social studies. Um, but there is just a, a mystique about it that draws people to it. And uh, when I go to do presentations at schools, I can capture attention for two and a half hours. And to capture fourth, fifth, and sixth graders' attention for an hour is a miracle. But two hours, I'm in here, I'm telling stories, I'm showing images, I'm I'm walking around, and these kids are totally fixated. It, it's incredible. They are so focused on it. And what's interesting about that is five years later, we have a whole new elementary school age group that's coming in and learning about Titanic. And five years after that, we're at the 25th anniversary of James Cameron's movie. And it was amazing. I asked my college classes this week, how many of you have seen the movie in its entirety? And it was only about half of them. Um, some of them, I had one girl that was born in 1997 when the movie was released. Mm -hmm. And um, she's, she said, I don't know if I want to go see it or not. I think the ship sinks and a lot of people die. <laughs> and I said, oh, no, 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 no. And, of course, everybody's laughing at that. But um <laughs> There's just some movies um, that are better off on a big screen, and this is one of them, to get a feeling. Row seven in the center used to be the best seat in the house, and uh, I may end up on row seven. First time in a while, but um, I may go back down to row seven to, to relive those great days of watching movies up close. Now, uh, I didn't mention this, but you are a physics teacher. In, in the North Carolina College. What's, tell, tell me the name because I know I'm going to mispronounce it. Asheville Buncombe Technical College is okay, the, thank you. the place where we are. And, I mean, there must be a ton of physical, physics lessons just from that incident itself. I mean, you got the irresistible force meeting the move, movable <laughs> object. I, I, I do bring it in sometimes. We talk about momentum, mm -hmm. uh, the mass of something times the velocity. It's not going to stop on a dime. It's not going to turn on a dime. And those two are directly applicable. When you start talking about pressure, pressure is equal to the force acting on an object divided by the area over which it acts. Um, and I talk about the pressure on your tires, 42 pounds per square inch, plus or minus, depending on which tire and which car you have. But when you go down to two and a half miles beneath the sea where Titanic is, you're 6,200 PSI. Wow. That's the equivalent of putting a postage stamp on the back of your hand and putting two cars on that postage stamp. And then everywhere there's exposed skin, you put another postage stamp and two more cars. And so that brings it home when I do the postage stamp analogy. Postage stamp's about a square inch. So that's roughly it. <laughs> that That is a scary analogy. <laughs> well, it, it really is. 
Um, what we do is we take objects down, um, styrofoam cups, for example. You get an eight-ounce styrofoam cup, and people will draw on the outside of it, and they'll put Titanic Expedition with whatever expedition they're on. And when it goes down to that depth, that pressure is so immense, it squeezes the air out of styrofoam. Styrofoam is technically like a foam. Mm-hmm. It's an emulsion with a foam and air mixed together, and it compresses and squeezes the air out. And that styrofoam cup comes back about the size of a thimble. And so that's what they get for free souvenirs by dropping some of those in a in a, a bag that's you know has openings um, like a laundry bag, mm-hmm. and those little cups come back the size of thimbles. But that's what that immense pressure will do. They've uh, the Russians, particularly with one of their dives, tried to capture a couple of animals that they found. Um, there's one big fish down there that has a huge long tail, a rat tail is what they call it. And so they they were able to get one and they put it in a container with water, but they didn't realize that that fish is used to that pressure. Everything about that fish accommodates that pressure. So as they started bringing it up, the outside pressure began to decrease and the inside pressure stayed high and pop goes the weasel is a phrase that might work in that case. The fish um, <laughs> flat. <laughs> no, it's flat. That, that, that. And they went, That's a scientific they term, though. You know. Well, they were hoping that the fish could do things with the respiratory to equalize the pressure, but it could not. So that was the only time that I know of that they tried to recover some animals to look at. How did you go from your, your fascination with the Titanic to actually getting involved with an expedition? <laughs> That's a big leap. Jim, I've been very blessed. And I've also... Uh, I would say something like, I'm very shy, but you would get everybody in my house to laugh if I said that. So I can't say that. Um, With the fascination in 1995, 1996, uh, the company who owns the rights to salvage the artifacts, to recover them, uh, has three obligations. Number one is they recover them respectfully and conserve them. Number two is they can't sell them. They have to keep them as a collection. And number three, they put them in displays and exhibits and museums, et cetera, uh, for people to see and to learn about the story. So this group did get permission to sell the coal that was in Titanic's coal bunkers that sprayed out all where the ship split. So what they do is they recover coal and they make small, cut small pieces of it and they offer it to sell. and. With the 1995 promotion, if you bought a piece of coal, with it came an opportunity to go out on a cruise ship to be at the wreck site. And the big advertisement was they were going to attempt to raise this big piece. Mm-hmm. This was going to be the highlight of the of the expedition. So I was able to go out there. I met all the dignitaries involved. They tried to raise the big piece, and there was a problem. So I'm geeking out. I'm sitting here drinking my Coca-Cola. I have a napkin and I've got, I take my pen out. All teachers have a pen somewhere. (laughs) And I start doing some calculations and some sketches on the napkin about how they can salvage and raise the big piece opportunity because Hurricane Edward was coming toward us and they didn't want to lose the big piece. Uh, It came down to two decisions the captain of a little ship called the Jim Killabuck and my suggestion, my, my, my recommendation. And the captain of the Killabuck chose his own. Um, didn't work. They get into a hurricane. Hurricane Edward had the ship bouncing up and down and they had to separate the piece to keep their ship from sinking. So this little big piece drops back down about two miles and sticks back in the ground. Um, the people that I'd met, I saw again in November, in um, Norfolk, Virginia, and we had a long conversation. We're sitting here having this great conversation about why are you not going into the interior staterooms and looking at all the people that traveled, Jim, carried their carry bags, and for third-class immigrants, everything they owned were were in those bags. That was their life. That was what they were carrying to their new life in America, and they're still sitting in those rooms. They really are literally in those rooms still sitting there. Um, clothes are still in some of those dressers. Um, medals are still down there. Um, 
the all, let's see, the Caldwell family, the man left $100 in gold in his bureau, uh, like side night table drawer. It's still sitting there on the floor probably by now that would maybe decompose. But there's $100 in 1912 gold there. That's about, oh, can be anywhere from seven to $8,000 in today's money, just the coin value. But the fact that it was on Titanic would probably quadruple it, every bit of it. So I made some proposals. I said, if I can make an ROV camera system that will go inside the ship, that's expendable. Will you use it? The one that they had, the Robin is a beautiful piece, incredibly intricate, but it cost a million and a half dollars and they didn't want to risk it going through these narrow passages, uh, debris hanging down and, and lose a million and a half dollars. So I said, if I can make an expendable one and we exchanged cards and I wrote the proposal up and I began to do my research and I built a camera system that went out in 1998 with them. And we went out there, we left from Boston and uh, in July, and we did not get back until um, Labor Day weekend of 1998. And just to tell you a funny story is this was during the time of the impeachment of President Bill Clinton. And so I'm out there during all of this. I don't know what's going on. I don't know all these things. And then I go into class on Tuesday after Labor Day for the first time. I meet my students and they're all making cigar jokes. And I have no idea what those are about. And one of my students says, you don't know. And I said, remember, I've been on the Atlantic Ocean. I've not even seen a television set until I got back to, to my town. And they told me what it was. I said, y'all are so full of it. That is so ridiculous. And they're going, no, it really, that's what it's about. And I'm going, oh, my gosh. So that's the time frame of me being out on the ocean. And uh, as I said, I was very blessed. I met some of the most incredible people in their fields out there from Ephraim which is the French research of sea exploration, P.H. Narzale and George Tullock from RMS Titanic, uh, Discovery Channel executive producer Maureen Lemire and her filming team, Stardust Visuals. Um, from NBC, me Jorgensen, Bob McEwen, Sarah James, who was, um, they were reporters and Mead was the exec who is still with NBC. And all of these people are at the top of their field. That's why they were assigned to this. And I got to watch the best of the best at work. It was such a great honor to be there to watch. So that's how I got involved. I made an ROV. The ROV still works. The ROV is sitting in my basement ready to be called to go back out to either a lake or an ocean for whatever purpose we need it for. Now, where exactly is the ship right now in the bottom of the ocean? About what? Uh, give us like an, an approximation as to the area that it's in. If you have a globe okay. and you go to Boston and then go straight across and then go to St. John's, Newfoundland and come down at five o'clock. Okay. Those intersect is a general area of where it's at. It's about 90 miles from Halifax, about the same from St. John's, and um, it's a, about 40 miles to 50 miles, I think, from the, the Grand Banks, which for instead of the deep, it goes up to about 300 feet deep for a long ways. The shall, there are shallow banks up there, but it's a tremendous location, very, very isolated. Right. And and as you said, the, the ship wouldn't be in one piece because just of because of time and salt water and well it fractured at the surface as right. it began to uh, as it as depicted in James Cameron's movie the bow became so heavy uh the stern with all of the engines and some of the boilers bent and fractured and the ship broke in two. The bow and the stern are about a quarter of a mile apart plus or minus. Wow. Yeah, but it basically uh, caved in on itself through the middle, right? When it when it cracked against the iceberg. Yep. Just imagine taking a long newspaper and pulling it down, and it did just like that. It folded in in about two thirds of the way from the front is where it folded. Now, I, I guess you know, I'm, I'm sorry to be morbid. I, I guess because th there were probably still bodies on the ship too, right? And they they can't be touched. Is that is what what the decision was made on that? There were 1,496. The correct numbers of um, survivors, there were 712 survivors and 1,496 that did not survive that night. Um, it used to be 705 and 1503, but research done around 2,000 by three or four different people at the same time 
all confirmed the 712 number. Um, yes, I'm sure there were some bodies that were in, still inside. Some people went back in, perhaps, and did not come out. We know that the engineers stayed inside to keep the lights on as long as they could. If the breaker switched, they'd go back over and, and try to flip the breaker again and try to keep the lights working. And uh, very few of those, they don't know of any of them that survived. But um, it's almost a given that there are some that did stay inside the ship. Now, Titanic's remains, the ship, um, lays on a bed that is highly saturated with calcium and carbonate. And what that means in simple terms is the mixture of the chemical it will cause calcium bones to decompose faster than just in regular water, just because it's near the ground. So human remains decomposed much quicker than they would just in a regular water environment. So there are no remains down there to be found. Um, Bob Ballard found shoes. He found a pair of shoes and he said, oh, my goodness, that's where a body came to rest. That is possible. Um, they also put shoes out in the hallways to be shined at nighttime. So as the water went through, it could have washed all these pairs of shoes out that were probably laced together. So that's why they stayed together. Um, but I'm sure that somewhere down there, uh, you know, a few of the bodies did finally come to rest. There were about 350 bodies recovered a few days afterwards. And uh, White Star hired a series of ships to go out and try to recover human remains. And uh, some of them were badly disfigured due to weathering and things like that. So they buried them at sea and they brought back about 350 to Halifax. And uh, Halifax did an incredible job of taking care of the of the bodies. Um, one of the undertakers, the morticians there in the town, wrote detailed descriptions of each body. Some they were able to identify because of items on them. John Jacob Astor, for example, his initials were on his clothes. He was carrying $3,000 in 1912. So you knew it was a rich person because of, you know, and the quality of the clothes. And so his family claimed the body and trained on a train back to New York where he was buried. Um, same thing with one of the Strausses that, that was claimed as well. Um, the poorer of those that were recovered, um, families couldn't afford to ship them back home to England or to the U.S., are buried there in three cemeteries in Halifax. That's actually uh, the reason why I bring that up is that's actually one of your projects about finding all of the names of the people that, that, that perished on the boat. We, uh, several years ago, created Project Name Them All. And if uh, any of your viewers are interested, uh, namethemall.com is the website. And our proposal, we have an international team, um, want to go up and recover DNA from the 42 unknown bodies that are up there. There's still 42 that were not given a name. Um, we have their descriptions, so we have some idea who they might be, but we want to go down, find some DNA. We don't want to bring the body up and put it on a table and say, oh, here's somebody's grandfather laying here. Look what he looks like now. These are the bones that are left. Right. Um, we want to do it with dignity and respect. Just recover the sample, leave, it, leave the body down there, go back and fill back in and use today's DNA technology um, to find out. The only thing we can give them now is their name. We can give them their identity, and we can give their family members today a place to go and honor a relative. And uh, I've got 243 family members who support this project of all the ones that have talked to me. Now, we're talking Titanic family members. That means one of their relatives was on the ship, did not survive, but was not named in a recovery. Uh, none have said, I'm against this project. I think, no. Every one of them wants to know, if that's my relative, use my DNA. Let me go first. What do I Tell me when I need to do this. Mm -hmm. um, the cemeteries are a little hesitant. They think it would have a negative um, connotation in the press. They think that the majority of people would be against it, even though... They've never asked the Titanic families, what do they think? Um, I've got one Titanic family member down in Florida. He's uh, near Orlando, Altamont Springs. His father was on board. Now, 85-year-old Frank Jr. 
is the son of nine-year-old Frankie Goldsmith, Titanic survivor. Now, nine-year-old Frankie lost his father, Frank John Goldsmith. All of them are named Frank. That's confusing. Okay. <laughs> Frank John was not recovered and identified. And there are two of those possible graves that may be his grandfather. And it's like he told me, you're darn right. I want to know if that's my grandfather. I would like to go to his grave one time before I die and pay my respects to the man who is responsible for my entire family. He has two brothers. There are three, three siblings and uh, all the grandchildren and even some of the great grandchildren. Now there are about 40 of them plus or minus. And he said, I'm going to go even if you don't identify my grandfather. He said, because I'm going to stand there and honor someone else's grandfather. I'll stand there for them. And I thought, Frank, you're the man, you know, <laughs> that is so awesome that you would do that just because it's that powerful to you. And he said, whoever that was, was near my grandfather at that yeah. time. And I thought, wow. So that is a project that um, we hope to revisit. COVID pretty much stopped a lot of that discussion. And uh, we hope to to venture back into that. Now, you are the author of Our Story, which is celebrating the 20th anniversary of the 1998 Titanic expedition. But what we did, this was really interesting. My uh, publisher is in Oklahoma. She's a wonderful lady. And um, I have knit that was this was my first written work that I've had published other than just white papers and scientific papers and things like that. So uh, I had an idea and she said, let's try it. We can always revisit. And what I wanted to do is contact all the members of our expedition and say, I'm going to put this book together. Send me your thoughts. Send me funny stories, sad stories, scary stories, how you felt, what you experienced. Send me some paragraphs and I'll put your name on it in the book. So it's not just Bill Willard doing his talking. I'll introduce and tell and set up this idea and set up what's happening. And then I'll put what other people said with their names on it. So you'll get to see how Charles Haas, who is a great Titanic author, beautiful writer, by the way, how he feels in many spots. We have a, a San Diego author named Susan Wells, and her words are just so beautifully written. They're just immaculate. Um and then we have, instead of historians, we've got forensic and that uh, people who do forensics analysts. Forensics, they analyze forensically. Let me say that. It's too okay. late. <laughs> um, and they're telling us about all these different things and funny stories. And and uh, the, the publisher, she said, now, you've sent me three chapters. I'll probably read them in the next few days. And about three hours later, I get this email from her and says, oh, no, you did not just do that. And I said, what's the matter? And she said, I decided to read chapter one and I got into chapter one and I couldn't stop. I had to go to chapter two. And she said, that doesn't happen to me much. Usually I put the bookmark in and I'm ready to, you know, but I read chapter one and you set me up so bad I had to keep reading. <laughs> so then I'm reading chapter two and I'm going to bed after chapter two. And she said, and dad gum, you went and did it again. You did it at the end of chapter two. So I read chapter three and now I'm stuck at the end of chapter three. When am I getting chapter four now? I need to know this. I am really <laughs> anxious to see this. And um, with just my, my wife helped edit um, and with her wonderful editing skills and my ability to tell tall, tall tales and, and stories, we combined for an excellent work. And so many people cooperated by sending us things. We do some other things, too. We've lost several members of our expedition team. Um, so we paid a tribute to them and let people say things about those crew members, those those team members. And I am glad I thought to do that because we were a cohesive family out there for a short while. Everybody from diverse backgrounds, diverse occupations, working as incredible professionals. Now, Bill, after knowing this much about you in the short time that we've known each other, I'm sure the listeners want to know what exactly happened when you went on that expedition to to salvage some of the some of the boat. Now, you guys can't see it because it's this is audio and uh, in Bill's background, there's a large piece of they call it the big piece, right? It's a piece of the ship's hull. The big piece. It's currently housed in the Luxor in the Titanic artifact exhibit in the Luxor in Las Vegas is where it's mm -hmm. at. Uh, when we went out on the wreck, 
uh, to the wreck, we had several objectives. The first objective was to recover Big Piece. They had tried in 1996. It did not was not successful. So we came back with the big guns. Ephraim came in, and uh, Pierre Valdi was one of the the project managers on the recovery part. And the neat thing about it for me personally was he said, you are the man with the other plan in 96. I remember your name. And I said, yes, I am. He said, you're the physics teacher. I said, yes, I am. He says, your idea was excellent. It would work. It would have worked. And they did not listen to you. It was excellent. And I that made my day right there just to, <laughs> to hear an expert say that he thought my idea was excellent. <laughs> you know, the head swelled at that moment for a little bit. Um, so part of the team got working there. A second thing that they were going to attempt with an NBC and a um, Discovery Channel partnership was to show the first live television show from the bottom of the ocean. And they set up a couple of different um, systems going on down there so that we could see things live during that television event. It was the most watched show, excuse me, the second most watched show behind only Charles and Diana's wedding, um, the live show that was shown around the world. So Charles and Diana's wedding was number one, and we were number two for a long time. I forget what surpassed us, but it had that much worldwide interest in 1998. Mm -hmm. And uh, they did some more recovery a little bit later. They did some more projects a little later. My ROV T-Rex had its infancy. It it did its testing dive and um, everything was fine. Um, we were on the bottom of the ocean. We were on the bottom on the seafloor and we got news about Hurricane Bonnie hitting North Carolina. And that caught our attention because here we are so far away from land and we were breathing a sigh of relief because it was going to go about 300 miles south of us. However, early in the night, it changed tracks, which normally hurricanes can do if they want to. They they, they do what they want, and they're not going to do what <laughs> anybody tells them to do. And they were headed right at us. The storm was coming at us. And here we are on this. There's three ships out there, and all these landlubbers are going, oh, boy. Uh, one of them left very quickly, and then two of us were there getting ready to ride it out. The um Nadir and Ocean Voyager. And um, they told us, quite frankly, uh, don't go outside. Don't go outside unless you have to. And even then, tie yourself to something because this is not your normal little joyride in the wind. And uh, we hit the storm and we were in the hur hurricane for 17 hours. And for a long time, we rode 80 foot waves up and down. And you could hear the anchor as we were going down, the anchor would swing away from the ship and then boom, it would hit the ship as the ship started back up the next wave. And we were just very grateful the anchor did not penetrate into the hull. If it would have done that, we would have had to jump in the water and um, get in our lifeboats and things like that in a hurricane. So um, there were some people that got very religious during that time. Um, there were some people that who were religious who were just sitting there saying their prayers. Uh, there were some people holding on going, yeah, every time we'd go up and down. And uh, it was uh, a, a moment to remember. It really was. Um, I remember the next morning after we, all of us did get a few hours sleep, we come out on came out on the deck and the sea was so flat and calm. And it was a beautiful sunrise, beautiful sun. And we were all very, very grateful to see that side. It was just outstanding. It was a, a great memory. Um, some of the other things that we did there that's very memorable is we arrived on site. It was daytime when our ship got there. And at 1130, um, several of us historians went out on deck and we found each other just by chance. We all wanted to do that. 1137 is when Titanic struck the iceberg, ship's time. And so we were out there and somebody said it's 1137 and we looked in the water. We looked right there where the ship sank and we actually stayed out there till about 2.20 a.m. Um, that was still 10 o'clock our time. So we were all wide awake anyway. Mm -hmm. And at 2.20 is when the ship finally went down. And it was very, very powerful, very emotional to be there 
at that time and you looked out in that water and you could almost hear the voices. You could almost see the people um, as they've been portrayed in a couple of the movies. You can almost feel the energy that was there. So that was very fulfilling. They also extracted what they call the little piece. Now, could, could you give me an idea of what, how big the big piece is? The big piece, when it was brought up, weighed 17 tons. Ouch. <laughs> now, you know, why it wasn't just really simple to bring up. They had to get a, a huge system to bring it up. And it looked like a, a large rectangle, but in the middle of it was a tail dropping down that was about six or eight feet longer. So it was awkward. You've got this huge, beautiful rectangle and then this eight foot tail hanging down. Um as they got that in and started doing conservation, they started having trouble figuring out how they were going to transport this. Because if you lay this flat on a flatbed, you're going to have something sticking over into the next lane hitting cars. Or you're going to have to take up two or three lanes going down a road. So the powers that be said for safety's sake um, and for transportation, we're going to make a couple of small incisions on a couple of the I-beams and separate the two. The big piece is the upper rectangle, and that lower tail piece is the little piece down in Orlando, Florida. Okay. And the little piece weighs about a eh, about a ton and a half, <laughs> um, depending on who you talk to down there. Sometimes they say it's three tons, but it's really about a it's about three thousand pounds, twenty eight hundred pounds, something like that. What was the one thing that you probably would have loved to have found on the ship? That is an incredible question, and I'll share with you what I told George Tullock, who was the project leader in charge of RMS Titanic. To, to me, the biggest treasures in that ship, and I'm not talking about selling them at an auction. Right. I'm talking about the things that are going to have the power and the value to me are in the third class and second class cabins because people that were traveling carried everything in those carry bags. And... uh an example, Frankie Goldsmith was going to bring a cap gun, and his mother told him he couldn't bring it. In their carpet, which is still in the cargo hold, Frankie hid his cap gun in that carpet, along with his mother hiding. She wrapped up her sewing machine in, in that carpet. Wouldn't it be incredible to open up that carpet, and there's little Frankie's cap gun still there, protected by the carpet, and his... uh Little Frankie's mother, Emily Goldsmith's sewing machine. Imagine seeing those two pieces with the carpet behind it and hearing this story and in talking about little Frankie. Frankie Goldsmith grew up in Detroit, and this is back in the time when Detroit had Al Kaline and Mickey Lolich and Bill Freehand and Jim, uh, let's see, Norm Cash and several others that were great in the early 60s. Uh -huh. and he lived close enough to the stadium that if they hit a home run, the fans would just cheer uncontrollably. And Frank, Frankie, the nine-year-old boy who is now an adult, right, uh, would be so rattled because he said the cheers reminded him exactly what the people in the water sounded like while he was in a lifeboat. And it would just get him very upset. He would have to maybe leave, close his windows, turn on some something so that he could not hear those sounds. So there's so many great stories for everything down there. I would love to to bring up. We've learned things about people because what they found in the, their baggage that we didn't know about in real life. Mm -hmm. It led us to the history of who is this person? Why is this person on the ship? Why do we have these things in their bags? And it's incredible. It's incredible what we can find out. Yeah, you, you're really getting almost a person's life story from that moment in time just by the possessions that they happen to have on that boat. Well said. Very well said. You also run something that's called Titanic Con in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. So not too far away from Dollywood. Very close. <laughs> Titanic Con um, started about 2016. And the reason why we started that is we just wanted a group of friends to get together, talk about Titanic, share stories. I had met Frank Goldsmith, and he wanted to tell us his family story. I met Julie Williams, and she wanted to tell us the Caldwell story that she's related to. And uh, I met Shelley Binder, who was a professor of flute 
at the University of Tennessee, and her great grandmother is Leah Axe, who was a Titanic survivor. And all of these pieces came together. We found an idea. We found a meeting room. We started having these yearly conferences. COVID stopped us for a little while, like it did everything sane and normal right. in America. You know, everything shut down. Even, you know, when Waffle House has to close down, the world is definitely not the same. <laughs> so, um, Titanic Con this year, we're going to be in Las Vegas. The plan is to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the raising of the big piece. Uh, the the plan right now is to invite the twenty the um, 25th crew, our expedition team, to come back. We're going to do two days of talking about the expedition, recovering the piece. We're going to see the piece in the museums. We're going to autographs, photographs, meet people, just have quality time. Our third day uh, is what we're trying to do, and I've got a couple of professionals helping me, is we're getting casts, for, uh, some cast members from the movie. Um, there's nine that we're going to invite. We would be happy if we can get four or five to come for the day. We want them to do and talk and tell us their memories of filming this movie. And then we want to do several panel discussions where the people that come get to ask them questions. And then they'll sign autographs. They'll pose for pictures. They'll talk to people and just have a get together where everybody gets to share. Everybody gets um, a good experience. They're going to learn about the big piece. They're going to learn more about the movie. I call the movie Jack and Rose on the Love Boat um, because it's Jack and Rose on the Love Boat. But if you remove the Kate and Leo story, the rest of the movie, James Cameron went to incredible lengths to make that ship look like the real Titanic did. He went to the original carpet maker for the, the ship to make his carpet, the original plateware and silverware and lamps to the original manufacturers to make his for his ship. And he was very meticulous. He brought in some of the best experts to help make sure that it looked real. And when I went to see it the first time, I just absorbed the whole movie. But uh, two or three times, I started looking at a lot of the background things that happened and how accurate those were. And I was very pleased with all of that. You know, some people say, but Jack and Rose were not real. That movie's not good. And I went, but Jack and Rose brought $4 billion worth of people to watch that movie. <laughs> and because of that, they've learned what really did happen on Titanic. The people in the water, the, the ship sinking, the recovery by the Carpathia, all those things did happen, and it's real. I had a student come into my class. Now, this is 1997, 1998, and the movie had been out about six months. And she goes, Coach. How many times have you seen Titanic? And I counted and I said, I think seven. And she says, I'm going again tonight. This was a Thursday night. She says, I'm going again tonight. This will be my 28th time. I just love Jack and I cry every time he dies. And 28 times this teenage girl went to see this movie. And uh, I told her, I said, well, you'd think they'd miss that iceberg once in a while, but they hit it every time, don't they? And she goes, can they miss it? And I went, no, it's a, it's a movie. So it was it was great. So what else uh, do you think really needs to be done as far as like people learning more about the Titanic? What what do you see, feel that there's like a missing piece? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, the one thing that has happened is a lot of the current experts are getting older, mm -hmm. um, and I don't mean that in any derogatory way. It's just <laughs> These people who have been for 30 and 40 years, the experts are getting in their 60s and 70s. Sure. One of my my good friends we lost was at 92 years old a couple of years ago, Jack Eaton. Um, Jack Eaton probably forgot more things than I know. That's how much he knew about Titanic. He was such a wonderful man. And, oh, he loved to tell stories. He was such a great, great human. Um, but there's so many experts. And George Behe. Uh, Don Lynch with the Titanic Historical Society is another one. Um, every time I name one, Charles Haas is a, a great one. Um, all these people are are not young 
spring chickens anymore. Mm-hmm. What we need is younger people to come along and take the the the, the flag and to take up the, the challenge of teaching the younger generations about this. And we hope they will. You know, I'm I'm old myself. My students tell me that they found some dirt that they think is younger than me. And I said that I wouldn't be surprised because <laughs> I am old as dirt. Um, we need a lot of younger people. I talked to a young fellow the other day on a Zoom call. He's 12 years old, and this kid was spouting off facts and stories and which books he had read. And I'm going, here's a candidate for one right here. He was awesome. Great young man. Um so the Titanic Con, what we hope to do is share these things. We do have some young people coming. Parents did have let their kids miss school a day or so to come to this conference. Uh, my website is voyagesexplorertitanic.com. And there you find a link to the Project Name Them All page. You'll find a link to the Titanic Conference page. Now, we're not going to update it until probably the first or second week of February with the new conference information. We're going to start registrations about March 1st. We're only going to host right now 250 people. Once we get to 250, we'll start a waiting list. The price of our meeting room doubles if we go over 250. So if we get to 300 or 350, then, yeah, we can go ahead and engage that larger room. But uh, 250 is going to be our cutoff at this time. Um, VoyagesExploreTitanic.com, and it'll have links about those type things. It'll show my goofy looking picture on it. And um, it does have some historical information of both about Project Name Them All, uh, about what happened in Halifax. And uh, it shows pictures of our previous conferences. And it's really an uh, informative site and things like that. We we try to have a lot of fun at those. Love to have you come out there, Jim, and you could do a live remote with with some people and ask them what they think about the ship. Yeah, you're gonna really have to twist my arm to make me go out to Vegas, Bill. <laughs> so, uh, could you let everybody know the, the title of your book one more time, just so if they want to check it out? If they want to search for it on Amazon or Barnes and Noble, look for Bill Willard, W I L L A R D, our story, and it'll take it straight take you straight to it. You'll see the big piece on the cover. Um, it's our story celebrating the 20th anniversary of the 1998 Titanic expedition. Now, it came out four years ago. That's why it says 20th anniversary. And we're um, uh, getting ready to hit 25 this August. So uh, the reviews on the book, everybody has been so generous and so gracious with their kind words. Um, I've had people email me on social media. I am a, uh, if you're a Facebook person, Titanic Con 23 is where you can find the, the conference information. But people will send me messages about, I read read your book. I have a question. I read your book. I loved it. Here's a question. And so I'll I'll take the time to do all those things as, as soon as I can. A lot of people are really, really been nice. When they have those conventions, they don't pile all the ice all in one big mountain, do they? We try to avoid those. That's it. <laughs> okay. His name is Bill Willard. He is an expert in Titanic. Check out the website, voyagesexplorertitanic.com. And also his book, Bill, thank you so much for coming on. This is very educational. Great honor, Jim. Thank you for having me. Let's get back to the ship. Sorry about that. No. A very special thanks to Mr. Bill Willard for coming on the show. Make sure you check out his website and even his book. I'm sure it's really fascinating. There's a lot of specials that he's appeared on as well involving the Titanic. And we will see in the future what else comes to mind. And maybe you can even check out Titanicon this year. And if you go, let me know. Drop me a line on social media. You know where to reach me. It's Chirpolution on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You know, I want to clarify a remark that I made earlier during the interview when I was asking about the bodies being buried in the ship. And I said that I apologize for being morbid. I wasn't referencing Bill's project, Name Them All, which is honoring all of the victims who were down there who still need to be discovered. I think that's a really noble project, and I wish only all the best to him. So I just wanted to be sure that there wasn't any misconstruing of my comment there. I don't think Bill took it that way. He's a really great guy, and we had a lot of fun. Even after the interview finished, we were talking for about 20 minutes, and he had me laughing with all sorts of stories as of his tales as a teacher in school. We are here every Wednesday with new episodes Be sure to check us out on your favorite podcast apps or at SharePollution.com. And there's this podcast app I'd like to tell you about. It's called Podopolo. I think I'm saying it right. P-O-D-O. 
P O L O. <laughs> There's a lot of O's in there. And you can get that absolutely for free on the Google Play Store or on the App Store if you've got an iPhone. And this podcast is playing there. And you know what? If you sign up there and listen, absolutely free, of course, it helps podcasters get paid. I never ask people to donate money if they don't want to. But just by listening and downloading the podcast and, and subscribing, you know, you'll be doing the show a great service. And if you do that, I appreciate it. I'm thanking you in advance. Again, thanks to everybody who was covering for me these last two weeks. We'll be back next week in some way, shape, or form. Well, I don't know what we're going to do. We will find out. Maybe it'll be a big surprise. I don't know. <laughs> but until then, this is the first time I get to say this for a couple of weeks. Viva la Sherpolution, and we will see you next time. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to the Sherpa Screening Room. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, review, and share this podcast. I'm Mr. Bruce, and this has been a Sherpa Loose Studios production. Viva la Sherpolution.